In the previous two episodes, we switched a device on and off automatically, and then learned how to control power to that device over the internet. However, we really haven't talked about being able to sense if that device is on. And without being able to sense anything, we can't begin implementing real automation. We have a number of sensors at our disposal, but we want to sense if that device is on and how much electrical power it's actually using. To do that, we're going to use this non-invasive current sensor, also known as a split core current transformer, or a CT sensor. To use a CT sensor, we put the hot or neutral line feeding our appliance through the core. As current flows through the hole, it induces a current in the core, which in turn induces a current on the secondary windings that are wound around the core. This particular model can be found for about $10 and has 2,000 secondary windings. This means that as two amps flow through the core, one milliamp is induced on the output. A few things to note. First, always use a burden resistor across the output leads. If you don't, the voltages between the leads will be unpredictable and possibly quite high. Second, you don't want to put hot and neutral lines through the core at the same time. If you do, you'll read zero amps as the alternating current is 180 degrees out of phase between the lines and will just cancel each other out. To create our sensor circuit, we want to put the hot or neutral line through the CT sensor's core. As current flows through to our load, like a lamp, a current is induced on the secondary windings. We want to choose a value for the burden resistor, RB, so that the voltage across it can be measured by an analog to digital pin on the photon. Also, I'll abbreviate analog to digital as ADC. From the data sheet for the CT sensor, we know that it can sense up to 30 amps. We'll assume that's the amplitude of the alternating current, which we'll call the primary current, or IP. We'll call the output current IS for secondary current, and that is equal to IP divided by the number of secondary windings, 2000 in this case. As a result, at max primary current, we see that max secondary current is a sine wave that swings between 15 milliamps and negative 15 milliamps. Now, at max current, we want a voltage that has a peak-to-peak -peak value equal to the maximum input on the photon's ADC, which is 3.3 volts. We can now use Ohm's law to determine the value of the burden resistor. At the max peak, we have 15 milliamps for IS and 1.65 volts across RB. Solve for RB and we get 110 ohms. While we can certainly buy a 110 ohm resistor, I happen to have a few 100 ohm resistors lying around, so we'll go with that. I recommend choosing a value of a common resistor that's lower than the ideal value for RB. If you go higher, then max current will result in a voltage that's beyond the sensing capabilities of the photon and could possibly even damage it. You might have noticed that we designed the voltage across RB to swing between positive 1.65 volts and negative 1.65 volts. The problem is that the ADC can't detect negative voltages, so we'll need to offset the voltage by one half of the ADC's max value. And half of 3.3 volts is 1.65 volts. We'll do this by offsetting the reference voltage. This is the node marked by the minus sign in the schematic. Now, at maximum primary current, the voltage at the plus sign in the schematic will swing between 3.3 volts and 0 volts in relation to the photon's ground, or common voltage. Let's implement this voltage offset by creating a voltage divider from the photon's 3.3 volt pin. We'll use two 10K resistors to cut the voltage in half. And for good measure, we'll put in a 10 microfarad decoupling capacitor, which should help remove some high frequency noise on the line. Note that the output of our CT sensor has a 3.5 millimeter TRS plug. We'll designate the tip as the part that's connected to the ADC and the sleeve, or sometimes labeled ground connection, as the part that's connected to the voltage divider. To plug in the CT sensor to the breadboard, we'll need to solder a 3.5 millimeter audio jack to a breakout board. I'm using a breakout board from SparkFun, but there are plenty of others available. We'll also need some 0.1 inch headers. First, place the audio jack onto the breakout board's top side. Make sure you use the soldering iron tip to heat both the pad and the pin before feeding solder into the joint. Repeat this for all the pins and clean the board with rubbing alcohol or something like flux off. For this board, we'll need five header pins. Safety goggles are highly recommended. Attach the pins to the bottom of the board and flip it over. I recommend placing the pins into a breadboard and using a pen to support the board while soldering. Once again, clean any residue flux off the board with something like rubbing alcohol. 
pat it dry, and the board's ready to use. To make life easier, I recommend using an extension cable that has the wires individually insulated and separated side by side. These can be found on Amazon or at most hardware stores. Using an X-Acto knife, carefully separate one of the strands. The two strands on the edges should be hot and neutral. It doesn't matter which one you use, as long as it's not ground. If you expose any bare wire, throw away the extension cable and start over. 120 volts can be a nasty thing for you or your pets. Once you have it separated, clamp the CT sensor core around the lone strand. Start with the same circuit from the previous episode. You could, for example, use it for a project that switches off an appliance whenever it's used too much power. Place the audio jack in the breadboard at the end opposite the photon. Connect a 100 ohm resistor between tip and ground on the audio jack breakout. Place a 10 microfarad capacitor between the ground rail and one of the rows. If it's a polarized capacitor, make sure that the pin with the negative side markings is placed into the ground rail. Put a 10k ohm resistor from the ground rail to the same row, and put another 10k resistor from the 3.3 volt rail to the same row. Use a jumper wire to connect the voltage divider row to the ground pin on the audio jack. Use another wire to connect tip to A0 on the photon. Plug the CT sensor into the audio jack and plug in the photon. Before we dive into the code, let's talk about RMS. RMS means root mean square, and is a way of talking about AC voltage and current as a constant effective value. Let's assume that we have an appliance that's drawing current. Because it's alternating current, we'll assume that the current fluctuates between 2 amps and minus 2 amps as a sine wave, which varies with respect to time. If I asked you, what's the average current draw, you might notice that the current spends just as much time in the positive region as it does in the negative region. As a result, the average current would be zero. That doesn't make sense since the appliance is obviously running and converting electric energy to motion, light, or heat. So we need another way to talk about the average current that's being drawn by the appliance. We'll use the statistical root mean square method to find this. To find the RMS value, we'll sample the current at constant intervals. We'll square each value, add them together, divide by the number of values, and then square root the whole thing. This will result in a positive number. For continuous sine waves with no offset, the RMS value is equal to the sine wave's amplitude divided by the square root of 2. For our 2 amp amplitude example, the RMS current would be about 1.414 amps. Create a new particle app with some name like Power Monitor. We'll need some special math functions, so include math.h. Ideally, we'd have another circuit that measures the RMS voltage, but for now, we'll have to assume it's 120 volts. Make some more program constants. Offset equals 1.65, num turns equals 2000, r burden equals 100, num samples equals 1000. These parameters should look familiar from the circuit. The only new thing we added was the number of samples needed to get a decent reading and calculate RMS current. 1000 seems like a good place to start. Leave setup empty, we won't need anything inside of it. In the main loop, we'll take 1000 readings of the voltage from the CT sensor's tip do some math to convert it to the current flowing to the appliance and compute the RMS value. To do that, we'll need some variables. We'll do our sampling inside of a for loop. To start, read the analog voltage from A0, convert it to a voltage level by multiplying it by 3.3 and dividing the answer by 4096. We'll then subtract our voltage offset to get the real voltage across RB. We then convert the voltage to the measured AC current by dividing the voltage by the burden resistor's value and multiplying it by the number of turns in the secondary coil. We then square the current reading and add it to our accumulator value. Calculate RMS by dividing the accumulator by the number of samples taken and square rooting the result. We calculate the apparent power by multiplying RMS voltage by RMS current and publishing it as an event to the particle console. Finally, we wait 10 seconds before taking another set of samples. Save your work and upload it to the photon. As an example, I connected my desktop to the extension cord so we can measure how much power it's actually using. Let's turn it on and take a look. Head to console.particle.io, click on logs, and you should see the published events start rolling in with the amount of power being used with volt amps as the unit. You might notice that volt amps seems a little weird as most of the time power is expressed in watts. That's because volt amps are used for apparent power and watts are used for real power. To keep this simple for now, 
know that apparent power and real power are related. Having capacitors and inductors in your load can make it so that the apparent power is different from the real power, but for most home appliances they will be fairly close in value. If we had a real-time voltage monitor circuit to go along with our current monitor, we could calculate real power and get a better idea of what the power company would charge for using that appliance. For now, know that being able to measure apparent power is still extremely useful. For example, with two photons and knowledge from these past few episodes, you could make a dryer monitor and something else that flashes in another room whenever your laundry is done. That seems pretty useful to me. How else would you use a current monitor? Leave a comment below and Thanks for watching.